Hello and welcome back to War Economy and State. This is the Mises Institute's Foreign Policy and International Relations Podcast. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Zachary Yost, one of our writers who specializes in foreign policy. And uh, Zach, we're going to talk this time about the Middle East, because I went back and looked at all of our old episodes, and it turns out we have not really devoted any episodes primarily to the Middle East at all. And as you pointed out, that seems almost kind of natural because the U.S. hasn't really been focusing much there uh, these days. Uh, so much talk about Ukraine and China. The Middle East seems like something of an afterthought. Of course, if you're my age uh, and you were an adult, you know, I was about uh, in my early 20s during the days of Iraq War II in 2003, the Middle East was a big, big deal. And everyone was paranoid about Islamism. And uh, we were supposed to think all day long about Iran and Saudi Arabia and Iraq and Israel and all of that stuff. And that's kind of gone on the back burner. But I think some recent developments in the Middle East have really showed, I think, maybe where trends are going globally in relations with China, in U.S. relations with the Middle East. And a lot of those relationships uh, are pretty important. And the indications are that while the U.S. will certainly continue to be important in its own way and not just it won't cease to be important at all, but clearly isn't the only dominant factor anymore in the Middle East. And but before we get into what's going on right now, it might be helpful just to talk about some of the the historical realities in the Middle East and what really guides a lot of the relationships there, because I think your average American, even our informed audience, is generally pretty well read and smart people. Unless you keep up with that stuff, you might use a refresher about uh, who, what are the relationships in the Middle East. And I think all of this news about Iran uh, becoming friendlier again with Saudi Arabia has been pretty important because I think one of the important factors in the Middle East in the last 50 years or so has been that Saudi Arabia, and, and especially since the revolution in uh, Iran in 1979, Saudi Arabia and Iran are not friends, uh, that they're, they're competitors as being the dominant power in the regime. And if you look at the map, you got one on the northeast side of the Persian Gulf, and you got one on the southwest side of the Persian Gulf. And so they're just natural enemies of sorts, if you will, uh, or at least natural competitors over dominance of that region and of over uh, important oil resources, being able to export uh, their own energy and uh, really dominating perhaps the global oil trade through those methods. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind in the background about the Middle East. And also then there's more ancient problems of religious uh, factions as well, right? Saudi Arabia, these are Sunni Muslims. And in Saudi Arabia specifically, uh, even the more extreme vo version of uh, Saudi Islam, which is Wahhabism. Uh, and then in, on the Iranian side, you have uh, Shia, or what we used to call Shiite, and not uh, it, it more, the more popular recent term apparently is Shia uh, Islam which is a different group, and they're just not the best of friends uh, between the Sunnis and the Shiites. And the U.S. has, of course, sided with the Saudis for a long time. This stretches back uh, at least to 1971. The closer relationship goes back that far, where uh, after the U.S. went off Bretton Woods and realized that there might be some serious problems in terms of global demand for the dollar— the U.S. went to Saudi, sent uh, Nixon sent his Secretary of State, I believe it was, to Saudi Arabia and said, "Hey, um, we'll offer you implicit military protection if uh, you agree to mostly do business in dollars." 
And that'll prop up demand for the dollar. And by the way, now that you're sitting on this mountain of dollar, Saudi Arabia, you can plow it all back into uh, U.S. treasuries, and that'll help prop up U.S. deficit spending and U.S. debt. So then you had the creation of what's known as the petrodollar. And then as time went by, there was some sort of creepy relationship between the Bush family and the Saudi Arabians, and this was all very evident in Gulf War One in the early 90s, and then later in uh, Gulf War Two or the Iraq War in 2003. And we saw pictures of George W. Bush walking around holding hands with uh, the head dictator of Saudi Arabia. And uh, there was clearly some sort of close relationship there that uh, that helped to sideline Iraq and, Sa and uh, Saddam Hussein. So there's just been a long relationship there. And also has helped explain why the U.S. has decided, in spite of all the claims about paranoia over Islamism, why the U.S. decided to ally itself not with the secular Arabs in Syria and Iraq, but with the most extreme Islamists in many cases in Saudi Arabia, many of whom, uh, a country whose it was mostly their citizens who were involved in the planning and execution of 9-11, at least according to the official account. So uh, it's been just kind of a weird journey over the last 50 years or so in terms of the U.S. relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia and with Iran. And by the way, Israel has always had an interest in sidelining Iran and Syria. They have been close allies also with Lebanon and uh, Hamas. Some of its funding has come from Iran and from Syria. And uh, the, the uh, Israeli state has always had a big problem with that. And so now if Iran is, may, is becoming close to friends with Saudi Arabia, um, and Saudi Arabia, by the way, just recently invited Syria back into the Arab League. And that's not Saudi Arabia's thing officially, but Saudi Arabia dominates this, the Arab League. This all, that's bad news for Israel. It kind of sidelines the U.S. to some extent. And uh, as you noted, it, uh, it certainly is important to China as well. So there's even some other factors here with the Chinese side of things, and maybe you can kind of note the importance of that as well. Right, yeah. So there's lots going on. The Middle East is a uh, big, complicated mess. <laughs> Has been for quite a long time. Um, and yes, as you know, I just want to sort of touch on something that Saudi Arabia, Sunni, Wahhabist, Iran, the home of Shia Islam, uh, and you can point to relationships around the Middle East on this sort of axis. The uh, uh, Syria is the home. I forget their technical name, but they're sort of the, the Assads are sort of this offshoot of Shiism. Hamas, uh, Shia, um, the Houthis in Yemen are Shia. So you can point to like, oh, this Shia axis sort of thing versus Sunni. But on the other hand, it's not that this is the exclusive lens through which relations take place. Iran is a uh, buddy-buddy with Armenia, the, the, the first official Christian state, uh, and that's because of Azerbaijan, a Muslim state they don't get along with. Um, so uh, just to point that out, um, yeah, it's one could make the argument that the U.S., uh, involvement in the region has been immensely destabilizing. I mean, obviously, in the, you know, Iraq war and all that, millions displaced people, war going on for decades. Um, you can point in, in the... Previously, the U.S. government had a policy of uh, balancing Iran versus Iraq, and we would play off one against the other. Then, I believe it was sometime in the 80s, we said, we're just going to contain both of them ourselves. We won't use one to contain the other. We'll just contain both. <laughs> and, uh, you know, then we have all this intervention in the Middle East and whatnot. Um, and, you know, basically ever since then, you know, then the, uh, the Arab Revolution, ha Arab Spring happened, and there's been all this trouble. Uh, now the U.S. has been forced to take a step back from the region because contrary to the uh, national security doctrine of uh, last year, the U.S. is not capable of uh, doing everything. Uh, I mean, we still are involved in the region. We have a whole fleet in the Persian Gulf. We have, uh, 
I don't even know how many now, a few thousand troops in Syria doing who knows what. Um, and, but we're not as involved as we were before. And people have made the argument that this is why, as it were, peace is breaking out, <laughs> you know, relative before. Because if, if you can count on someone else to be paying your bills, basically subsidizing you, then it, it changes the calculation of, you know, fighting. Uh, you know, the U.S. was very, very involved in facilitating Saudi Arabia's war with Yemen and things like that. Now we've taken a step back, and all of a sudden, all of the incentives and all the, you know, calculations change because now without the U.S. there sort of as a sugar daddy, oh, well, peace, <laughs> war is expensive, problematic, peace is breaking out. And as you noted, in both cases, the so, uh, so Saudi Arabia and Iran broke relations, I think, in 2016. They, they did not have diplomatic relations. They restarted those relations. That's facilitated by China. Similarly, with the sort of peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Yemen, that was facilitated by China. And we, like, let's look here. It's in China's interest to have a stable Middle East. They import tons of energy resources from the region. Um, it's sort of in almost everyone's interest for a stable Middle East, because everyone, you know, has to have an IV of uh, petroleum <laughs> products uh, hooked up to their veins. Uh, so some people are shrieking, oh no, the U.S. is being supplanted as the, you know, global power broker, and China's taking our place. And to that, I would just respond, who cares? Uh, there are several <laughs> factors here as to why we can say who cares. Uh, just in general, the, our, our goals are aligned, ours and China, in terms of wanting to have access, <laughs> you know, wanting to keep the oil flowing. Two, uh, you know, oil is a global commodity. There's, it's called the bathtub theory of oil. It's, it's, all of the oil just pours into the global market. So it's it's not as if, uh, you know, if, say, Iraq or, or, or someone just was like, we're not selling oil to the U.S. anymore, which, and I'll get to this in a second, we don't really import much oil from the Middle East. Say they said, we're not going, we're embargoing the U.S. Unless they just take the hit and are like, we're not selling oil to anyone, that oil will be sold to someone else who then won't be buying oil from another place, and we could buy the oil from there. But a major shift in all of this that it seems some people have not caught up with is sort of the shale revolution here in the U.S. I mean, we're, we're practically, I mean, for actually a year or two, we were, we did, we were uh, net positive on oil production. We're sort of a little, a smidge below that now, but it's not, we're very, we're very close, and Canada and Mexico have lots of oil, we're not really relying on the Middle East for oil anymore. So you can see why, you know, the gears are spinning in the heads of the, <laughs> you know, uh, Middle Eastern despots as to they need to change the relationship with the U.S. Um, and also, I would say this is why we ha I've lost count of all the crazy product projects that Saudi Arabia has announced, the, the like ginormous, like hundred mile long city or something and all kinds of crazy stuff. It's like, well, we have all this money. We better find something other than oil. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I would say those are sort of things in play here. And another tick in the column of, you know, why... Why are we so involved with Saudi Arabia and all these, you know, I mean, Saudi Arabia, they literally cut a journalist up with a hacksaw, <laughs> you know, I mean, these aren't nice people. Um, and it's, don't get me wrong, sometimes we have to work with people who are unsavory, but I would say we don't have to in this instance, so let's not, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, you know, have been kissing Saudi Arabia's toes for, for decades, and what are we getting out of it? I mean, recently it's been a big deal and people are starting to get mad about it, about Saudi Arabia cutting oil production. And they just cut oil production again two days ago. So we're, we've bent over backwards for Saudi Arabia and we're getting literally nothing out of the deal. We can't get them to pump more oil of what you, they're, they're of no use to us at all. So, you know, 
and they're realizing that it's probably coming down the road, hopefully. So that's why they're altering their strategy. We should note also that by cutting oil production, they're helping Russia, too. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> and so that's just another way they're thumbing their nose at the U.S. is not only does it... Uh, uh, further uh, help OPEC, essentially, but OPEC plus, which includes Russia. And this then just funnels more money to the Russian regime, which, of course, is the opposite of what the U.S. is trying to do right now. And yes, so many examples of this. And, and we should know this is all stuff like in the last two years that if you go back and you look at Soviet or Soviet Saudi uh, Iranian <laughs> relations just in 2020 it was pretty bad and the US certainly was still carrying on what it had wanted uh, its general policy this is when uh, Trump of course around uh, maybe his 2018 or so traveled to Saudi Arabia and spent a couple days there with which i mean just it was sickening to watch how much he was fawning over the saudi regime yeah, the, the orb the, the, right the, the orb <laughs> the, so many memes about <laughs> and vice versa and he sold them insane amounts of weapons and and so then they just turn around and you can see that they they just don't really care that much what the americans think and i wonder how much was the long-term strategy or how much was it of china just in the last couple of years really upping efforts to really do something to secure access to oil in the regime. But yeah, looking at that, right, um, all of these issues that played to the U.S.'s favor, right, the un ongoing conflict in Yemen, which continued to stoke, I think, anti-Iranian sentiment in Saudi Arabia, because there was a loose alliance there between Yemen and, and the Iranians also convincing the Saudis to eject Syria from the Arab League, uh, but which Saudi, Saudi Arabia is now, that's all past tense now, and, and really have just diminished importance there. And now they've normalized uh, diplomatic relations with the Iranians. Iran the other day, or uh, Saudi Arabia the other day, hosted uh, Maduro uh, from Venezuela, just like, I don't know, a day before... Um, Blinken shows up in Saudi Arabia to talk about U.S. interests there. That was in some interesting timing. And so just the whole thing is uh, just really quite remarkable and, and very little mention of Israel's interests in any of this from, from U.S. policy. The U.S. hasn't really been doing anything uh, to really stick up for the state of Israel uh, which, in, you know, I don't think the U.S. has any obligation to do that. I just think it's unusual that, that you're not hearing more about it. Right. Yeah, I think part of that is um, um, Netanyahu is very unpopular among, you know, the quote unquote enlightened, sophisticated classes these days. And I can't remember if it was some other leak <laughs> or if it was from the Pentagon leaks we talked about last time. But uh Apparently, the U.S. government is like, yeah, we actually don't, we don't know if Israel is going to bomb Iran's uh, <laughs> uh, nuclear weapons project or not. So, I mean, it's sort of, who knows? I mean, they could do that, which would stir up the pot, just as the U.S. is already trying to do too many things at once. Um, but, I mean, I've not been following Israeli domestic politics too closely, but it's rather tumultuous. There was... I forget, they had like a record-breaking number of elections and governments in a very short amount of time. And then uh, Netanyahu was out of power and the Israeli Arabs were in the government for like, I guess, the first time ever. And now Netanyahu's back in power and he's also being like prosecuted for things. And so it's sort of a, a mess there as well. But yeah, I would say it's, uh, we're not as obsessed about what Israel's doing, uh, but uh, also, just so people are up to date, there's been a lot of talk about Iran's nuclear weapon project. And recently there's been talk of like, oh, gee, maybe we actually can't blow it up now <laughs> uh, because there's been like a low key sabotage campaign against it for a long time. Uh, Mossad agents, you know, throwing bombs onto uh, <laughs> nuclear engineers' cars and things like that. Um, and we have like they're these called they're they're like these missiles or bombs called bunker busters. I think they can penetrate like a hundred or two hundred feet down into the earth, which is sort of 
wow, that's scary. Um, but now the U.S., uh, the, the, I mean, Iran is now building facilities beyond the reach of any known <laughs> weapon, basically. Um, I mean, if you build something in a mountain, you could nuke it, and it'll still be there, um, more or less. <laughs> uh, so it does seem that the ship might have sailed on stopping their ability to create a weapon if push comes to shove. I mean, sort of the ideal position for a state to be in is where they don't have a nuke, but they could have a nuke if they wanted it in six months or something. Um, and so the ability to not have the program wiped out in those six months is the key factor. Um, yeah, so it, if... It will be interesting to see what happens. We could see some nuclear proliferation in the region because if Iran is, you know, six months away from the bomb, well, other places might want to be, you know, at the same level. Who knows? We'll have to see. Um, but yeah, it's uh, things are changing, hopefully for the better for the U.S. Who can say about the people there themselves? Though? Yeah, well, of course, if there is proliferation uh, there, you want... <laughs> You want to keep the U.S. as minimally involved as possible, then, and let them let them fight it out. Just like it would become insane to get involved in Pakistan-India relations, uh, right. where you've got two nuclear-armed states that are still fighting over Kashmir and some of those. They got some border issues there, and they just don't like each other. And yeah, stay out of that. Yeah, and that's another comes to mind. Another horrible partner I and mean, Pakistan was <laughs> cooperating <laughs> with the Taliban all 20 years we were in Afghanistan, yet we're still, you know, buddy-buddy with them. It's quite strange. Well, we should note, by the way, that the U.S. probably shares a lot of the blame in basically forcing Iran into the arms of China, um, thanks to the U.S. abandonment of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which... Right. The the international treaty that was designed to really finally work with Iran to put a lid on its nuclear program and find peaceful uses of nuclear energy only in that country. And uh, and this would all be in exchange for uh, normalization to some extent for repeal of a lot of these sanctions on Iran, which are very harsh sanctions like they they catch. Not, mil not just military aid and stuff, but like medicine and food and lots of things and gravely impact the standard of living there for regular people. But what has become apparent, I think, to the Iranians since Trump is that no matter what they do, the U.S. Is, has an interest in ratcheting things up and making more and more demands on the Iranians. And so uh, you could see why they would just come to the conclusion where, well, this is just going nowhere. We have no reason really to work with the Americans. No matter what happens, the Americans will never accept us. So let's go talk to China about it. And that seems to be a pretty important issue uh, there with China having happily accepted the entreaties. And then this provides an opening for Iran to make friends with everyone else in the region if it can to some extent. So that there seems to be just a cascading of events here where the U.S. says, well, no matter what you do, we're not going to live in peace with you. And so that just that just gives them reason to abandon the U.S. altogether and any hopes they had of of being a U.S. part of the U.S. axis, if you will, that's just gone. So um, I think the U.S. has certainly had a sizable role in that. Right. Yeah, I I don't, I think part of me suspects it's sort of like just uh, our weird inability to, you know, just improve relations with Iran. Part of it might just be like a boomer thing to some degree. The boomers cannot, you know, let go that they took Americans hostage from the embassy. It just like ingrained in their mind, you know, for <laughs> as long as they're around, Iran just must be punished. Similarly, Iran's not friendly to Israel. Lots of people want to support Israel. Um, and also, it's, it's somewhat ironic, there's sort of an overlap between Israel and Iran in terms of they both have lobbies here in the U.S. <laughs> Iranian expatriates hate the government of Iran. And I mean, it's, it's sort of a meme among some circles about how like Iranian expatriates like 
you know, typical Iranian expatriate, some guys being interviewed and he's like, you know, the government should have bombed Iran, not Iraq, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's just, uh, and also, I mean, lots of Iranian expatriates are like wealthy Californians. <laughs> so <laughs> that also plays a role in things, I'd say. Um, it's sort of just the double whammy. Yeah, never forget about the importance of just domestic interest groups in these sorts of things. Uh, just a few years ago, one of those wealthy Iranian families, which owns a bunch of pistachio orchards in California and maybe also Arizona, was opposing the normalization of trade with Iran because it would have negatively impact the pistachio trade in the U.S. It would have massively pushed down pistachio prices because apparently they, uh, um, they produce a lot of pistachios in Iran. So it's sort of a bootleggers and Baptists sort of situation where you've got both the you got foreign policy people who are obsessed with foreign policy in Israel joining forces with just some rich Californians who want to keep the lid on trade. And so you just then have endless perpetuation of these existing policies. But yeah, I think the fun thing of it is uh, I just wonder how many old timers at the CIA and stuff are just pledge to, as long as I'm here, there will never be normalization of relations with Iran because of how they humiliated us in 1979. And I think maybe that explains somewhat of the partial normalization of relations with uh, Cuba, is a lot of the, the people who were around in 1959, they're just dead now. So <laughs> that's it. Yeah, the joke is the Cold War is over everywhere except for Miami. <laughs> And this is worrisome when it comes to Cuba, because I think, as I said in our uh, Monroe Doctrine episode, you know, I'm like, normalize relations with Cuba immediately. You know, the I do think that the prominent role Florida is taking in GOP politics could render that a difficult thing to make happen for the foreseeable future. Who knows? Um, yeah. And on the sanctions thing, it's also worth pointing out Yemen like 75% of its population is food insecure, basically, because of the sanctions put on the country. Um, so, yeah, and it's it just the frustrating thing about sanctions is they just have a record of not ever working. North Korea is still alive and kicking and testing ballistic missiles, you know. They've been sanctioned beyond, you know, belief, and they're still here. Iran's still here. Everyone who's sanctioned is still there in the end. Um, Venezuela. Yeah. And, and on the, on the normalization with Iran or whoever else, I, I look to Charles de Gaulle as sort of the model statesman when it comes to recognizing international realities and sort of like the, the shining moment that I look to of what I aspire to <laughs> when it, even in my personal life, when it comes to, you know, having a level a headed sort of real politique view of things is, uh, you know, after the fall of France, there's a lot of concern in the UK about what's going to happen to the French, well, you know, the Vichy French Navy. And um, a large section of the French Navy was stationed, I, I don't remember if it was in Tunisia or, or Algeria, basically French North Africa, in the port, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but of Mirs el Kabir, I think. And the British shelled the French fleet. Ships were sunk, a bunch of French sailors were killed, the French were very outraged. And de Gaulle himself was understandably quite outraged. Uh, but so like he found out about it at night and he was like super angry. Then the next morning he had a meeting with the British and he said, if I was in your position, I would have done the same thing. So uh, sort of this ability to separate, you know, instinctual spur of the moment emotions from thinking in the long term, trying to stand in other people's shoes and understanding why they do things, I think is helpful, <laughs> not just in foreign policy, but even in your own personal <laughs> and interpersonal relations and all that sort of stuff. But it's sorely lacking in the U.S. And part of it is because we don't need to. We're so strong and powerful. We can do whatever the heck we want. And, you know, we don't have to worry about our cities being bombed, really, and things like that. So it, in a way, it's sort of, uh, one could argue it would be good for multipolarity to emerge around the world in that it checks the U.S. And obviously, we don't want it to get out of hand. We don't want another Cold War. But just sort of 
if people can get through their heads that the U.S. can't just do whatever it wants because X is out there, you know, hopefully not in a super military Cold War fashion, but just where we live in a multipolar world are, you know, we lack self-restraint, so we need external restraint in a way. Yeah, and uh, and of course, uh, the world recognizes that you don't even have to become uh, on the same level militarily with the U.S. to just limit the U.S.'s ability to meddle in your region endlessly. And I think you're seeing some of that now with the, the headlines the last couple of days has been Iran running around telling everybody that it's about to form this Gulf-wide, Gulf region-wide naval alliance designed... I hadn't seen that. <laughs> against, yeah, check it out. Um, it's in Reuters uh, this morning, and National Review has an article about it. It's actually hard to find much said about it from the Saudi side. Um, but what they're saying, hey, hey, we're going to have joint naval exercises now. This is what the Iranians are saying. We're going to have joint naval exercises now with the Saudis and with other Gulf states, and we're all going to agree on security for the Persian Gulf. And we're going to make sure that oil flows in and out of the region without any any outsiders meddling to tell us how it's going to happen. And National Review, of course, takes a dim view of this because they think the U.S. should be uh, in charge of the Persian Gulf. And uh, already talking about how, well, this is this is. This is okay if they're just going to fight pirates or something. But if this if this takes on a defense dimension where they're actually defending the region from foreign interlopers, well, that's just terrible. Now, that's such an American way of looking at things, right? Is that You could see being alarmed if the Gulf states wanted to form some sort of offensive capability, <laughs> right? To send a boat to the Gulf of Mexico or something. They have no plans for that. All they want to do is maybe be able to keep people out of their business, in the Persian Gulf, which is no threat to the United States whatsoever. And as you note, it's not even threat really to U.S. energy resources. It would just force the U.S. to maybe play nice with the Venezuelans to get some of their oil uh, or the Mexicans to get some of their oil. It's already happening with Venezuela, by the way. I think we covered, uh, I can't remember if it was Chevron or Shell or mm, that's right. one of the giant oil conglomerates got permission from the U.S. government to sort of get back into Venezuela. Which is all to the best. Yes. I, I, I mean, it's the Americas. Yeah. This fits right into our other episode about the Monroe Doctrine, right? If there's plenty of stuff close to home that the U.S. could focus on rather than meddling in the Middle East. So, yeah, if if uh, Tehran wants to have something going on with Riyadh in terms of a, no, a local naval alliance, there's really no downside uh, for the U.S., there. Um, as you know, and if China somehow sponsors all of that and gives them a bunch of money, fine. Okay. Uh, that just makes life easier and cheaper for the American taxpayer. Uh, so it is a sort of multipolarity then, I think, a regional multipolarity of sorts. Yeah. And we could, you could argue that really what the U.S. strategy now is doing is subsidizing China's access to oil. Through the Strait of Malacca and everything, it's like we've got to keep the super highway of oil to China open. I mean, that's one way of attacking people. Are you soft on China? You want to? <laughs> uh, that's why you're so concerned about the Middle East. Um, and also, just as an interesting side note, um, Eugene Goltz, who I think is at Notre Dame now, um, he has all kinds of interesting papers on various things about sort of global markets um, and uh, things like that. But I think he worked for the Pentagon or some government agency at one point where he produced this enormous report on whether it was even possible to stop the flow of oil out of the Persian Gulf. And so he uses the case studies of, uh, I think it was called the tanker wars sort of during Iran-Iraq, and just points out like, even like the strait was mined, for goodness sake, there's a war going on and the tankers kept on coming in and out, you know, and he talks about how um, insurance rates shot through the roof, but it was still profitable for these tanker companies to be coming on in and out. So it's, uh, yeah. And I'd also point out one point that people will argue about is the U.S. needs to maintain the open seas sort of thing. And uh, this, I mean, this is one way in which 
trade, which I'm all for, but can intersect with sort of an imperialist outlook on things is sort of, we have to, <laughs> by force, keep open these uh, sea lanes and whatnot. And uh, we had that episode, I don't remember if it was the Monroe Doctrine episode or a separate one, where we talked about nearshoring. It's like, sure, let's protect the sea lanes of the Western Hemisphere. Um, but it just sort of like, if all these Gulf states want to take care of their own sea lanes, that's great. I mean, it's not like, as we talked about the global oil markets and all that, but it's it's not like they're going to shut off all trade, you know, through the region. It's, it's That's just not going to happen. That's in no one's interest. So let them take care of pirates and preventing, I don't know, some rogue state from trying, but probably failing to close down the, the trade routes. Well, and it should be in terms of trade, too. Um, Iran just finds itself, I think, thanks to the war with Russia, in a improved position as well. As you've noted, right, it's uh, it's funneling more oil to China, so China's uh, really expanding their uh, their strategy there. But but Russia sees Iran as a crucial partner in terms of pipelines and trade and moving uh, trade through Turkey and the Caucasus and to that part of Iran that's outside the Persian Gulf. Sometimes people forget that a large portion of the Iranian coastline is outside the Strait of Hormuz, and they're looking at building pipeline, a pipeline terminal there, and basically port cities and really developing some of those areas. So even if you did somehow manage to close off the Persian Gulf, Iran could just keep moving oil to uh, China without any real choke points there at all. And that provides a trade outlet for Russia as well, if they can get their goods down, because uh, they can go straight through Turkey and into Iran. And now that the Iraq is much a closer Iranian ally, more U.S. mismanagement, uh, that it's all just part of a large global trade scheme. So yeah, these these are smaller countries. They can't afford to cut off trade unless they want to become horribly impoverished. Right. And this is something I think lots of Austrians are very good at, at pointing out how, like, sort of the current international trade situation is not exactly like a natural free market sort of uh, how things would emerge in a stateless world or something. Yeah, there's uh, so many, all these treaties and things that are, you could say, distorting trade. And one way of looking at it is that U.S., the U.S. has been subsidizing sort of the global trade infrastructure for so long. And now when people are like, oh, gee, it's not great to be so dependent on the U.S., we're seeing patterns of trade emerging that might have emerged otherwise absent the U.S. action. I mean, there's a plan for a big pipeline from Russia that will cut through Mongolia, um, things like that. Yeah, I'd, uh, it's my understanding that trade on the Caspian Sea has bumped up quite a deal, a great deal, since the uh, Ukraine war has happened and all that. Uh, there's the Belt and Road Initiative, which China's pouring gajillions of dollars into. I'm not. It's in a way <laughs> China might be making a similar mistake to the U.S. Um, in in that land transportation is many many times more expensive than sea based transportation. But if they want to give Kazakhstan and whoever else gajillions of dollars, go ahead. You know, uh, <laughs> why should we care? I mean, there are people who say we should care, but I don't think we should. And it's just, um, we will see how things emerge. And all the people freaking out over the closer relations between Russia and China, someone is some, I would argue that this relationship is probably. I mean, really, it's historically an aberration uh, between the history of China and Russia and seems to be a product of the U.S. and our policy. So if the U.S. policy changes, perhaps we'll see that relationship fracture. Who knows? But uh, I think there are all these arguments that don't really get a mainstream hearing by the blob of why it's okay for the U.S. to not be doing X. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap it up with that for this Middle Eastern episode. I'm sure we'll have to return to the topic uh, before too long. 
Uh, but uh, for those uh, listening, thank you for tuning in to this episode of War Economy and State. And we will be back next month with another episode, and we'll see what new disasters we have to report on at that time. Uh, but until then, have a great month. Thanks. Thanks.